Good day and welcome to worship. Today is another day for worshiping God with our heart, soul, and minds. We start our, st our time together off with our confession of faith, the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father and Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only begotten Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate. He was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven, where he sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. From Daniel chapter 5, beginning with verse 1. King Belshazzar gave a great banquet for a thousand of his nobles and drank wine with them. While Belshazzar was drinking his wine, he gave orders to bring in the gold and silver goblets that Nebuchadnezzar, his father, had taken from the temple in Jerusalem, so that the king and his nobles, his wives, and his concubines might drink from them. So they brought in the gold goblets that had been taken from the temple of God in Jerusalem, and the king and his nobles, his wives, and his concubines drank from them. As they drank the wine, they praised the gods of gold and silver, of bronze, iron, wood, and stone. Suddenly the fingers of a human hand appeared and wrote on the plaster of the wall near the lampstand in the royal palace. The king watched the hand as it wrote. His face turned pale and he was so frightened that his knees knocked together and his legs gave way. The king called out for the enchanters, astrologers, and diviners to be brought and said to the wise men of Babylon, whoever reads this writing and tells me what it means will be clothed in purple and have a gold chain placed around his neck, and he will be made the third highest ruler in the kingdom. Then all the king's wise men came in, but they could not read the writing or tell the king what it meant. Reading a little bit further on in Daniel. So Daniel was brought before the king, and the king said to him, Are you Daniel, one of the exiles my father the king brought from Judah? I have heard that the Spirit of God is in you, and that you have insight, intelligence, and outstanding wisdom. The wise men and enchanters were brought before me to read this writing and tell me what it means, but they could not explain it. Now I have heard you are able to give interpretations and solve difficult problems. If you can read this writing and tell me what it means, you will be clothed in purple and have a gold chain placed around your neck, and you will be made the third highest ruler in the kingdom. Then Daniel answered the king, You may keep your gifts for yourself and give your rewards to someone else. Nevertheless, I will read the writing for the king and tell him what it means. O king, the most high God gave your father Nebuchadnezzar sovereignty and greatness and glory and splendor because of the high position he gave him. All the peoples and nations of, and men of every language dreaded and feared him. Those the king wanted to put to death, he put to death. Those he wanted to spare, he spared. Those he wanted to promote, he promoted. And those he wanted to humble, he humbled. But when his heart became arrogant and hardened with pride, he was deposed from his royal throne and stripped of his glory. He was driven away from people and given the mind of an animal. He lived with the wild donkeys and ate grass like cattle, and his body was drenched with the dew of heaven until he acknowledged that the Most High God is sovereign over the kingdoms of men and sets over them anyone he wishes. But you, his son, O Belshazzar, have not humbled yourself, though you knew all this. Instead, you have set yourself up against the Lord of heaven. You had the goblets from his temple brought to you, and you and your nobles, your wives and your concubines, drank wine from them. You praised the gods of silver and gold, of bronze, iron, wood, and stone, which cannot see or hear or understand, but you did not honor the God who holds in his hand your life and all your ways. Therefore, he sent the hand that wrote the inscription. This is the inscription that was written, Mene, Mene, Tekel, Parson. This is what the word means. Mene, God has numbered the days of your reign and brought it to an end. Tekel, you have been weighed on the scales and found wanting. Perez, your kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. Then at Belshazzar's command, Daniel was clothed in purple. A gold chain was placed around his neck, and he was proclaimed the third highest ruler in the kingdom. That very night, Belshazzar, king of the Babylonians, was slain, and Darius the Mede took over the kingdom at the age of 62. Please pray with me. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you alone are Lord and sovereign over all. We pray that you would help us to learn of you and to learn from you and to give you proper praise and honor. Thank you for these words which you preserved through Daniel. We prayed in your name. Amen. 
We are continuing along in our current series, Daniel. Of course, we've talked about how Daniel and his friends were deported to Babylon. They rejected the king's food because they felt it was defiled. And so even as they were being prepared for the king's service, they chose to eat vegetables instead. And um, the Lord honored them for honoring him, and they were given wisdom and insight, which we have on display in today's passage. Uh, God gave to Daniel miraculously both the vision that Nebuchadnezzar had been given at one point and its explanation. At a different point, Nebuchadnezzar built a large statue and required all of his underling officials to bow to it. Um, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that is to say Daniel's friends, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah refused to bow to it. God can save us, but if not, we're not going to bow to your gods. We're, we're not going to do that. Nebuchadnezzar threw them into an overheated furnace, and they were kept safe by a fourth man in the fire who showed up, who looked like a son of God or a son of the gods or some divine figure, may have been an angel, may have been the son of God meeting them and getting them through the furnace. And whether or not it was an angel or Jesus at that time, I will tell you, Jesus meets us in the furnace and he gets us through the furnace that we're in here. And Nebuchadnezzar gave glory to God at that point and even threatened people, don't speak out against the God of uh, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah on pain of brutal death because, of course, he's Nebuchadnezzar. Last week, we talked about Nebuchadnezzar's testimony about how God had given him visions and a warning about what he was going to do. Uh, he went insane, that is to say Nebuchadnezzar was given the mind of an animal and he lived among the animals for seven times until eventually... Um, he regained his sanity and learned to praise God who is Lord over all and gives kingdoms as he sees fit because Nebuchadnezzar was arrogant and needed to be pinned back or pushed back. From there, we get to the reign of Belshazzar. And of course, Daniel doesn't tell us how it is that Belshazzar becomes king. We just go from chapter 4 to chapter 5. And so here's some historical detail that's important to know. It certainly helps out a bit. Nebuchadnezzar either retired or died around 562 BC and is succeeded by his son, Evil Merodach. Uh, Neraglassar usurped the throne two years later and kills Evil Merodach around 560 BC. Neraglassar dies of natural causes around 556 BC and is succeeded by Labashi Marduk for around three months. Belshazzar leads a coup against Labashi Marduk around 556, a little bit later in the year, and proclaims his father, Nabonidus, as king. And here I have a couple of unfortunately wrong slides. Uh, it should not read Labashi Marduk, it should read Nabonidus, because Nabonidus is the new king. He goes on an expedition to Arabia and is gone for about 10 years, leaving Belshazzar in power. Why he's there? Don't know. But he was in favor of worshiping the god Sin, uh, the moon god of uh, the Babylonian area, uh, although the center of the cult is up in Haran, uh, as opposed to Marduk, who was the classic, traditional um, uh, Babylonian god. And so uh, when Nabonidus returns around 542, he's a zealot now, and he wants to really elevate the cult of Sin, over Marduk, and so he goes to Haran to build up the temple to Sin. And so again, Belshazzar is left in charge in Babylon. Apparently ruling in Babylon uh, was something he enjoyed doing. Now, he is technically second place, but he's ruling Babylon with the powers of the king. Around this time, the Persians are on the move, and so Belshazzar is reigning as regent in Babylon. Cyrus the Great um, had invaded. Um, Darius the Great was along with him, uh, and his army grew up around Babylon. The walls in Euphrates offered a good protection to Babylon, so uh, Belshazzar is not afraid at this point, so he throws a party for a thousand nobles, demonstrating his security. So effectively, yeah, we're in for a siege, but we're going to be fine. We've got strong walls. We've got lots of stuff. We've got the river protecting us. We'll not have to worry a little bit. Let's have a party. It's a very, very smug, very secure, very confident, overconfident sort of a moment. 
And so then this party becomes a very pagan. It was pagan anyway. It's being held by pagans. Very pagan party, which uses the Lord's table service. He's drinking wine and he wants to have all of his noble friends and his wives and his concubines and all that drink. And what are we going to do? We're going to drink from the vessels from the temple of the Lord. Now, why on earth does he do this? Why does he drink uh, wine using the Lord's table service? Why does he use these goblets to praise and toast in many senses the gods of gold and silver, bronze, iron, wood, and stone, even though this is definitely not the sort of a thing that God would approve? Well, either he just didn't fear any god or he's kind of being a thrill seeker at this point. They've got records of this God doing things, but you know, I'm feeling so secure, I don't even fear this God um, as I do things. It's possible. There's certainly some defiance going on here, which leads to a very brief interlude where we play a very, very basic game. You tell me, is this a good idea? So, first of all, thinking in terms of OSHA, is this sort of behavior a good idea? Is this the sort of a sawhorse we should use? Probably not. A lot of danger. Someone's going to get hurt. Uh, alternately, is this the sort of scaffolding we should use when painting? No, probably not. A lot of danger. Why are you being stupid with a lot of danger? So also, some of you like doing exercise. Is this the sort of a place where you would do elevated sit-ups of various kinds? On the one hand, you probably are going to be motivated to sit up rather than dangling off the ledge there. But is this really a good idea? No. A lot of danger. This could go very, very badly. Uh, this gentleman, of course, I don't know if you can see it or not, but he is not only working under his truck, he is arc welding under his truck with his truck propped up with just a couple of posts, and they're not even solidly rooted. Is this a good idea? Absolutely not. It's going to end badly, chances are. This is a man in Romania riding his unicycle around a chimney. This is a giant smokestack chimney. It is 840 feet high. No, this is not a good idea. Similarly, this man is probably going to be running from this bull for the rest of his life, no matter how short it is. Is it really a good idea to be running from this bull as opposed to uh, running away from this bull and getting out of its path? Well, people do stupid stuff, all right? Realizing that there's danger and people tend to do dangerous things stupidly, was it a good idea for Belshazzar to do this sort of a thing, because he's effectively sticking his thumb in the eye of the living God, the living God who drove his predecessor, not directly his father, but uh, the term father was used with someone you've got a connection to in the past, and he's connecting himself to the previous great regime. Do you really want to stick your thumb in the eye of a God who drove Nebuchadnezzar mad and who was able to miraculously deliver uh, Shadrach, Meshach, Shack, and Abednego. Doesn't make a whole lot of sense, but he did it anyway. This leads to a very sobering moment. Uh, he was toasting his gods with the Lord's table service. And then all of a sudden, the fingers from a human hand appear and they start writing on the wall. Now, the minute you see fingers writing on a wall that are not attached to a wrist, they're just up there writing on the wall. This is weird. This is scary. Maybe your first thought is, what is in this wine? But then over time, it starts to write and it continues to write. And he probably remembers, wait a minute, this is a God who has been recorded in the official records as having had power and done stuff. Maybe this was a dumb idea. Maybe I'm in an awful lot of trouble. He turns pale and his knees knock and his legs give way and he calls in the advisory staff. I need to know what this says. Whoever it is can read this. I will clothe you in purple, which by the way is very, very expensive, hard to come by. It's a sign of nobility. I will put a gold chain around your neck and you will be third highest ruler in the kingdom. Third? Well, yeah, because Nabadonius technically is the first highest ruler in the kingdom. He's reigning in Nabadonius' place. So of course, since Belshazzar is second place, uh, you, you'll be second only to me. You'll just be third position, third highest in the whole kingdom. And unfortunately, none of them can read this. They would have probably loved to because it would have been great to be able to uh, gain this honor and this wealth. Happily, the queen ends up remembering, hey, wait a minute, there was a guy who, back with Nebuchadnezzar, was able to interpret this stuff. Uh, let, let's bring him in. And by this point, Daniel is pushing 80 years old. So you've got to figure that he's probably been retired for a bit. 
but he's brought in. Belshazzar verifies his identity. Are you the Daniel who did all of this? Yes, I was. Okay, fine. I need to know what's written on the wall. I promise you, you will be robed in purple. You will have gold and you will have royal position. And Daniel is not terribly interested in any of these. Probably because he's had it. He's been retired. But more than that, he just responds in a very, very straightforward sort of way. Keep your gifts for yourself. <laughs> Give your awards to someone else. But I'll read that. I'll tell you what it means. There is no cozying up to wealth and power for Daniel. He's more or less going to tell you the truth, and he honors God. That is a baseline bedrock principle for him, number one. Number two, Daniel was probably aware of what was going on around him. He was no fool. Uh, he probably was aware of the Persian army that was besieging the city. He was probably aware of what... Belshazzar had been doing with his wild party, honoring other gods besides the Lord, because parties very, very often were public displays, and the lesser people were wanting to know what was going on. So this probably was all around town, what he was doing. Uh, Daniel probably uh, was quite informed, knew what was going on, probably knew what the Lord had said, knew what the Lord would do. He could read the writing on the wall, which, by the way, is the origin of that phrase, this encounter here and Daniel has very little interest in Belshazzar's trinkets especially because he knows what's going to happen to Belshazzar so yeah I'll tell you what you want to know but you can keep your stuff Daniel seems to be pretty confident he knows that it's not going to matter because it's not going to be his to give for much longer and so he preaches a bit of a sermon a contextual sermon your predecessor Nebuchadnezzar was great he put some to death. He spared others. People feared him. God let him get into this position. He became arrogant. He was deposed, driven insane, lived as an animal, lived among the animals, ate grass until he acknowledged the Most High God is sovereign over the kingdoms of men. You, Belshazzar, you also have not humbled yourself, but you knew about Nebuchadnezzar's insanity and you still went ahead with this. You've set yourself up against the Lord of heaven. You got his goblets, you drank, you praised your gods. You did not honor the God who holds in his hand your life and your ways. You knew better. You did stupid. You have mocked God. Effectively, this is what we're talking about. So you want to know what's written on the wall? I will tell you what's written on the wall. Mene, mene, which literally means numbered. God has numbered the days of your reign, probably mentioning it twice. God's numbered the days of your reign and your days are numbered because <laughs> you're going down. Uh, you remember that siege out there? He doesn't mention this, but, you know, at this point in time, it's very, very easy to see where regime change is likely to come from. Uh, you think you've been safe here? Your, your days have been numbered by God and your number may well be up. Tekel. Tekel is the Aramaic term for shekel. Shekel is a unit of weight that became eventually a unit of coinage. Um, so effectively, you have been weighed in the balances and found wanting. God is standing in judgment over him, and it's not going to go well. Uh, Perez, Perezin, actually, but that's a couple of Perezes. Uh, the funny thing about this language, of course, is, is that the only things you write down are the consonants, not the vowels. And so you've got a couple of combinations of effectively PRS. And uh, depending upon which vowels you put with it, one of them is going to be Perez, which means a half minor, minor, or divided. So on the one hand, you've got divided being said. And then the other one, he says, is Paras, which is the word for Persia. So your kingdom has been divided, Perez, and given to the Medes and the Persians, the Parases, uh, effectively you are done. Thank you for playing. Too bad, so sad. Goodbye. For reasons of consistency or for some other reason we don't know, at Belshazzar's command, Daniel was rewarded, given the robe of purple, gold chain, made third highest in the kingdom. Was he hoping to try and buy favor from Daniel? Don't know. Was he just doing this because he's trying to be consistent? Don't know. Was he trying to include Daniel in the regime so that Daniel gets taken down too? Couldn't tell you. Hard to know his motivations. The thing is, that very night, as the Euphrates had reached its seasonal low, Darius the Mede diverted some of the extra water from the river, and so the river went even lower. They came in through the culverts, effectively, 
uh, possibly aided by the priests of Marduk who were not impressed with the fact that the king was not honoring the traditional god of Babylon. He was honoring the, the moon god instead. Anyhow, that evening Belshazzar was slain. That evening the regime changed. Chilling. What do you do with this? Some people might say that God's just petty. He's salvaging his dignity, something like that. I could see people end up saying, God's just mean. You know, he's defending his pride. Wasn't Belshazzar just ignorant? Wasn't he just needing his own lesson? Well, let me just tell you an answer to that. First of all, we already know from reading the book prior to this, God is gracious. God was amazingly patient with Nebuchadnezzar. God was gracious with a man who was arrogant and didn't know the Lord. And he encountered the Lord and he had increasing lessons learning about how patient God is, how gracious God is, but the fact that God is God overall. Belshazzar had the benefit of knowing these lessons. These were records he was aware of. But the other reality is, is while the Lord is gracious and while the Lord is patient, the Lord will not be mocked. And we need to bear this in mind. And it's not about God's pride necessarily. It's about the fact that God is no pushover. And at some point, you have to lay down the law and demonstrate authority if, in fact, you are authority. Authority that doesn't follow through and an authority that does not, in many ways, make certain that the people who are under that authority realize they're under this authority, that authority isn't really going to be able to function at all. In my house, I used to have young people. I have less young people now, and I am far less young myself. But we dealt with overconfidence. We dealt with pride. We dealt with rule-breaking along one line of discipline. But one thing that would lead instant discipline of a harsher type was direct defiance of authority, because you cannot have that. We understood that. God, believe me, understands that. And to the outside world, the Lord will show that he is no pushover. History has shown this. Sacred history in the Bible has shown this. There have been plenty of circumstances where people, the godless people, have mocked God and he has not let that stand. Other times he's continued to be patient. But ultimately, he will bring those who mock him, he, he, he will superintend, when it, it suits his purpose, he will superintend their downfall because he is the Lord. In this particular case, the people of God were in Babylon. They were witnessing all of this. And the thing is, is it was not just about showing Belshazzar who's boss. It was about showing the people of God who he has let be exiled. Yeah, I'm no pushover. I let you be exiled here because you had been faithless. You're learning your lesson. But at the same time, I am God. I am holy. And we're not going to let this guy muddy the waters as to who it exactly is, is in control and, and worthy of respect here. And so they were witnesses of that. And we are witnesses of the fact that ultimately the Lord is the authority in the world and in world history to a nation that has called itself his, the Lord will also show that he is no pushover. It's not just the heathen, but his nations that identify themselves as belonging to him. He made Israel, and so, of course, he held Israel accountable. In many senses, we have made ourselves as a nation. This is very true, but we have, from our very, very beginning, very early time, called ourselves a great shining city on a hill. And Many of our presidents have mentioned this. Most recently, the guy who really talked this up was Ronald Reagan, who mentioned America is and always will be a shining city on a hill. The thing is, is that when that speech was given and when that metaphor was given to us, it was not so that we could be a beacon for people to emulate. That was baked into it. No, what was at the center of it was we are going to go, so the colonists had said as they were in the ship heading out to this place, we are going to go to this new land. We are going to be trying to set up a godly community. And if we're faithful to God, good, he will keep us going. But if we are faithless to God, we will be like a city on a hill. A city on a hill is going to be an example one way or another. If we're faithful, God will bless us. If we're not faithful, God will use us as a warning to everyone else and we will be an example for everyone else as he smites us in judgment. That was how we understood being a city on the hill on the one hand. 
back around that same time as we started to put together public education, we realized that the reason why we needed public education, especially up in New England, was because people needed to know the Bible. People need to know the Bible everywhere, but the, they, they were aware of this in New England. People need to know the Bible so that they couldn't be led astray by the devil. And so they needed to be illiterate, so therefore public education was set up. Later on in our nation's history, Benjamin Rush ended up saying, if we were to remove the Bible from public schools, we would be wasting so much time punishing crimes and taking so little pains to prevent them. That seems like a prophetic warning. A hundred years later, we took the Bible out of public schools. We stopped teaching people right from wrong. And a nation that had been blessed by a Christianized heritage, by a set of foundations, a moral compass at least, and the foundations to where people could be told, hey, this is God. You follow him, you don't follow him. Nevertheless, right is right, wrong is wrong. We took that away. We took that standard away. And what can we say now? We could say that we're having all sorts of problems with crime. We've got all sorts of problems with people even understanding what right and wrong is. Our public schools seem to have been handed over to a totally different perspective now. It's not about them ever instilling right and wrong. Now it seems like anything other than right and wrong is what they're pushing for. And many of them, not all of them, but many of them, I think if given a choice to remove either overt pornography and indecency from their, bio, uh, from their libraries or removing a copy of the Bible from their libraries, they'd sooner remove a copy of the Bible. Is this God's judgment on us? Well, not directly. God does not make people go wicked. But Romans 1 tells us about people who knew the truth about God and exchanged that truth about God for a lie and worshipped idols instead. And because they refused to worship God, even though they knew better, God gave them over to a depraved mind. Let them be depraved. All right, we're going to let you be depraved. We're going to see where this goes. We, in many ways, it looks like we have been handed over to a depraved mind. Not all of us, but fundamental parts of our society. Hopefully this is so that we will realize and learn this leads to destruction so that people can repent because God is always looking to bring people to repentance. He will bring judgment if people will not wake up and repent, but he is always, always, first and foremost, trying to just get people to turn from their sin. We need to pray for repentance in our nation. We need to pray that our nation turn back before we are destroyed. That's very, very true. Because you cannot actually break God's commandments. You can refuse to follow God's commandments, but the commandments still stand. They're not going anywhere. All you can really do is discover just how broken you can be upon them. Then we have warning about individual mockers who are trying to mock God from without the people of God. The classic joke, God is dead. Nietzsche, he said this around 1883, God is dead. On the other hand, God's response seems to be Nietzsche is dead which God seems to have decreed in the year 1900 because Nietzsche died. And this is on the one hand a joke, and on the other hand, here is an ultimate reality. Regardless of what else happens in history, everyone will live until they die, and then they will have to answer to God. And if you have remained in your sins, and if you are not in Jesus Christ, you will face judgment. That is simply true. And we have a warning from 2 Peter First of all, you must understand, in the last day, scoffers, same word can be translated mockers, scoffers will come scoffing and following their own evil desires. They will say, where is this coming he promised? Jesus, he's not coming back, right? Ever since our fathers died, everything goes on as it has since the beginning of creation. These people are saying, God's not doing stuff. Maybe God's not even there. But where is this return in judgment? Um, there's going to be scoffers who are going to say that. Yeah, yeah, you're stupid for listening to God or fearing God. Same sort of a spirit as Belshazzar had. They deliberately forget, Peter tells us, that long ago by God's word the heavens existed. The earth was formed out of water and by water. But this is, of course, by God's word. And these still waters also, uh, by these still waters at that time, uh, the world was deluged and destroyed. Again, at God's order and so there is a god and he will bring judgment and he is a holy god he will bring judgment at some point this is not saying 
that God's just there waiting with a stick to thwap people. He will, of course, bring that judgment. No, Peter goes on to tell us why is it that there is this delay, such delay that people end up boasting. Yeah, where is your God? Well, the delay is not because God doesn't care. The Lord is being patient because there's still people who will turn and be saved. And we rejoice in the fact that the Lord's patient means more people can turn and be saved. I got people I'm praying for that they will stop mocking him or they will stop being stuck in their own thing and that they will turn and be saved because the invitation to turn and be saved is open to everyone. The Lord's patience is salvation because he is trying to save people. We also have warnings about mockers from within. From within the people of God. Do not be deceived, we read. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. The one who sows to please his sinful nature, from that nature will reap destruction. The one who sows to please the Spirit, from the Spirit will reap eternal life. Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. I'm sure that some people are saying, oh, wait a minute, that sounds too much like, like works as opposed to grace. That doesn't sound like a loving God. That doesn't sound like a kind God. That's God lowering the boom. This guy must not know Paul. This, this must not be one of the more central books of the Bible that emphasize grace. This is from the book of Galatians. The book of Galatians is the go-to book written by Paul that talks about how we are saved by grace, not by works. Paul, by the time we get to Galatians chapter 6, has been through all of that. It is not that we are saved and made right with God by anything that we do except the fact that we find ourselves putting our trust and our faith in Jesus Christ. Nevertheless, to you who are in Jesus Christ, there's a warning it's one thing to flee to God for refuge and forgiveness of sins. And if you realize that you are a sinner and need forgiveness and flee to him, he has accepted you, he has received you. It is another thing to receive refuge and forgiveness so that you can keep on living for your flesh. It is a mockery of God and his loving kindness and his forgiveness if all you're doing is continuing to live in an unholy way even though God has forgiven your sins. Because that's not why Jesus went to the cross. And yes, he is patient. He is patient with people who are slow to learn. He is patient with people who continue to mess up. That's absolutely true. But when we become complacent and when we become unrepentant, at that point, God reminds us he is holy. There is a right and wrong. And the whole reason why he enforces right and wrong is because it is a reflection of his holiness. And he calls us to be holy and to take all that seriously. And he will not leave us in our complacency and unrepentance. And he knows that we fall into complacency. He knows that there are parts of us that he's been poking at. Hey, you need to give that up. You need to turn to me. Or there's stuff that we had given up at one point and it's sort of crept back in. And we kind of view it as those pet sins, those endearing sins, those little things going on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're just nodding at no, no, no. God will not be mocked. This is not so that we can bring you back to turn or burn. If your faith is in Jesus Christ, that's where salvation is. But you are called out of your complacency and out of your unrepentance to a real life of faith, living for him, not living for your flesh. He did not die so that you could live for your flesh. Do not mock him as needed. Beloved sons and daughters of God, turn from your unholiness. It creeps in, it creeps in in all of us. Turn from it and be forgiven because you are deeply loved. And God continues to refine and to hone us and to grow us upright and to bring us back from the things that are wrong. Turn to him with a real repentance. And from that, as his loved forgiven people live towards that new life that he's given us so that is to say live intentionally sow seeds in your life to please the spirit reaping a godly harvest this is how you honor the god who loves you living towards him and his kingdom not towards your own life and your own vice and your own flesh he has died to save you be forgiven be his he does not 
cast you aside, but he continues to turn you back to him. Be turned back to him, be made new and forgiven and live towards his kingdom. The continual exhortation through Daniel remains, be his, truly honoring him. His kingdom is the one to live towards. So, this week, spend some time with the people who matter most. Be looking for examples of people, heathens, who are mocking God. And you might just point and laugh briefly because this is a very dangerous, stupid thing to do. But when you see them as well, pray for them. Pray that God bring them salvation before it's too late. We don't know when that too late is for them or for this whole world or just for our continent. Prayerfully consider your own life. Are you complacently living to please your flesh? Are you mocking God by not turning from your sin? Where is this going on? Repent. Turn to him. He loves you. He is there to forgive you. Be forgiven and live in his love. Then pray for the grace and the strength to really change and live towards that new life that the Holy Spirit has for you. A life that is honoring your loving Father. Honoring him as God who is holy and Lord over all. Please pray with me. Loving Father, we thank you that you do care for us, you look after us, you grow us in the way that we ought to be. So Lord, first of all, we pray that you would turn us in true repentance to you, that we would honor you from our hearts, not just from our mouths, and that we would seek to live towards your kingdom, not towards our flesh. Please forgive our complacency and help us to live in new life. We pray for our country, Lord, that people would be brought in true repentance back to you, that the country would realize its need for you, that individuals would realize their need for you, that we would be turned, that we would understand right and wrong again, and that we would proclaim right and wrong so that people can be yours truly and completely. Lord, we thank you for the fact that you are patient. We pray for those who might still be saved, that they might be drawn into true faith. And we thank you for your kingdom that is coming. And we thank you for the fact that it will come and it will be a holy and righteous kingdom. Lord, thank you that in your holiness and in your justice, there will finally be justice. We pray as much as possible that people will receive your grace instead. But we thank you that there will be a good end to all of this one day. We look towards that day. We thank you. We praise you. We love you and we honor you now. We pray in your name. Amen. Now the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance on you and give you his peace. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.